This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. About patience. We go? Okay. Okay, so uh, I said this last week about the Rechaim Kodeshir. I noticed, though, that as we get closer to Pesach, there's more and more people attending the Shir at night. I wonder what that means. I think that uh, different venues. <laughs> They heard that Aaron's giving out food. That's true. I haven't heard Aaron's giving out food. Or shot is there's just this natural wave of Hasmada that comes over you <coughs> as we get closer and closer to Pesach. I have no other explanation. I've seen it, said it a few times. Okay, I heard this story from Rabbi Franz, or Zangazan. He said that when they were on the uh, train, the Amtrak train, um, back from the Sea of Mashas, and basically the whole yeshiva was on the train, and uh, they all stood up to Avmariv, and just then the conductor, as they got the Shmona Esrei, the conductor came in and said, tickets, tickets, and like, everyone's like, no. He's going like, tickets, tickets, and no one's moving, you know. A mass rebellion, you know. Boston Tea Party. So, um, finally he's getting a little nervous. So one person shows the conductor his watch, as if to say, just like, wait a few minutes till they finish Shmona Esrei. So the, the conductor says... What do you mean? We left on time, as if to say maybe that's the reason nobody wants to pay, as they <laughs> protest that uh, they didn't leave. Um, time means different things for different people. Um, somebody told me about his kid that said, uh, we're moving the. He told him to go to sleep early Friday afternoon, he should be able to be up for Shabbos. So he said to him, Why is it different? He said, Because we moved the clock. So he looks and says, we didn't move the clock, it's exactly where it is. Moving the clock means internally moving the clock. A lot of us move things, change things on an exterior way, but not internally. But what does it mean that the clock is ticking down as it gets closer <coughs> to Pesach? I just heard this story. Um, I, was, I went to be Menachem Abel, someone, and they were saying that uh, the Kapishan Sarebbe, the old Kapishan Sarebbe, He's in his shul, and somebody came over to him and said there was a dispute between two members of the shul. And one person was, whatever, um, perhaps being somewhat aggressive and trying to collect money that he felt was owed to him. And the rabbi called him in. He said, why are you doing it that way? And he said to him, you have, does the rabbi have another idea of how I can get my money? So the rabbi said to him, wait three quarters of a year. Wait three quarters of a year. Okay, so he figured uh, that that's how much time the rabbi needs to get the money out of the guy. Three quarters of the year comes and goes. He doesn't see a red cent. So he comes back to the... Well, my he was embarrassed to go back to the Rebbe to say, no. So he wound up waiting another three quarters of the year. Then he came back to the Rebbe and he said, I, I don't have my money. So the Rebbe said, okay, now you can do whatever it takes to get the money back. So he goes, all right, forget it. Like, I, you know, I'm just Michelin. So the Rebbe said, I knew eventually you're going to be Michelin. I thought it would only take three quarters of a year. It looks like it took a year and a half, he says. But the whole point was uh, stalling. So, as, as the clock moves on, it means different things for different people. As we've often said the story, for Mata Ephraim, Ephraim Zalman Magalus, he was a very rich man, and when the people came to Impurim, uh, some, of them <coughs> some of the people that came to, not because they wanted money, the Pashas wanted to give them an opportunity to fulfill the union of Kala Pashas, and uh, they were a little bit aggressive, and this huge vase that was very expensive came crashing to the ground. And the Rebetzin was very displeased, to say the uh, least. And the Rebbe Fraim Zalman, he was like, yeah, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And she was upset with him, while he wasn't upset. So he said, I, he said, you know, he said, uh, I'll be upset in a year from now, okay? I, I don't do it right away, I, I move slow. So she wrote down the, the date, you know, and she put it into her cell phone. A year later, she came back and said, okay, it's a year. Now you're upset? So he said, to tell me the truth, what are you upset about now? Are you upset about the vase? Are you upset about the fact that I'm not upset about the vase? She goes, no, by now I'm not so upset about the vase. So she says, you know, your father took me as a son-in-law because I'm illy, I'm, I'm like a genius. So I think ahead. So I said, I know in a year from now you're not going to be angry. So Mamela. I'm, I'm, I'm already I'm already not angry, you know. I'm I'm shooting ahead. There, there's a lot of pressure on people this time of the year, and sometimes you have to think, okay, what's going to be after Pesach? You know, look ahead a little bit, borrow a little bit from the time. But let's talk about the clock as it ticks closer toward Pesach. And there's a lot of pressure in homes. There's financial pressure for men. There is the cleaning pressure for ladies. And it builds up. And there's family pressures and shiduchim pressures and all sorts of things that come into play this time of the year. And uh, here, let me just 
Klobuchar. And uh, there's a ticking clock. There's a ticking clock that makes things even more difficult. Um, these 30 days, says the Chida, is an opportunity. It is a test to our patience. It is a test to our uh, perseverance, a test to our resilience to be able to stand up to pressure. But if we pass the test, then we're zaycha to acquire something that even El or Rosh Hashanah is not available to us. Ah, you're going to ask Akasha, what do you mean? Everything is decided on El. So what's decided now? Okay, you can ask that general kasha. It says, Bechad, Nedayna Malat Fuah, right? On Pesach, uh, Shem judges all the Fuah. I thought it was decided Rosh Hashanah. So let me tell you a beer that I once heard, which I think uh, is, is very powerful. Let me be Magdam a little bit, Hagdam. What's the difference in Chometz and Matzah? One cost a dollar ninety nine a pound, or one cost fifty dollars a pound. I'm besides for that. What's the difference in Chometz and Matzah? Chometz rises. Okay, it's yeast, it rises. Matzah is what it is. When, when you, chametz means you're anticipating. If I do this, it's going to grow, it's going to get bigger. And when it gets bigger, there won't be place. So I've got to move out the other person before I move in. If I give in now, they're going to think I'm a softie. If I'm, No, I'm not going to give in now because of what happened. And what's going to happen next time when she or he... Chametz means making chashboinus. Because what you see, we're not willing to deal with what is on our plate. We're, we're making all these chashbaynas about what's going to be, as if we know what's going to be. Matzah doesn't grow. Matzah is what it is. I deal with it. Okay? I remember once, my, my mother, Leah Shalom, was in the hospital. She wasn't feeling well. It was the night of Tisha B'av, Okay? I didn't tell her it was Tisha B'av. And she was having whatever digestive problems and the, from different therapies. And the doctor came in and said, um, you know, if you can get her cooked rice, that would be very good. Go look for cooked rice uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning, Tisha B'Av night, right? Even the sushi stores are closed, Tisha B'Av at night. So I came home. I said, I, 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 you know, my, 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 my wife, my daughters would have been more than happy to cook it for her. But I was going to wake anyone up. I can cook rice. It's not a shlomaza, right? What does it take to cook rice? So I took out the chong pot, you know, and I filled it up with water. And then there was this, like this big industrial box of rice. And I, I emptied the entire content of the, of the thing in it. And uh, I looked on the instructions. It says, whatever, 20, 25 minutes to cook. And uh, then I ran up to whatever I had to prepare for the kinnis for the next morning. And I'm upstairs and I'm riding away. And I hear this <coughs> strange sound coming from downstairs. Okay? And then my little one comes up and he says, uh, it's like a three-year-old. He goes, Tati, seken shnayin tishabav? It could snow on tishabav? I said, no, what are you talking about? It doesn't. I said, oh, no. And I ran downstairs, and I don't know, it was a, a scenario of, uh, should I say, it was knee-deep or ankle-deep in, uh, in, in uh, it was like, uh, I don't know, four or five inches, it broke the record of snow on Tisha B'Av, that was all coming up, you know, it's growing and growing. Then when my family came down, they were quite upset that I didn't wake them up to cook the rice, okay? We had enough rice to feed the entire Chinese army, never mind uh, to bring it, like, you know. Imagine a guy passing my house, two o'clock in the morning, Tisha B'Av, and there's rice coming out of the window all over the place, <laughs> How can we don that person like Hafschus? You know, something very strange is going on in here. <coughs> now, rice isn't chametz, but the idea is that chametz rises. So you always have to anticipate what is going to be. So when it comes to chametz, which is the Yetzirah, we're never really making a legitimate um, assessment of what's happening. We're always thinking, if I do A, he's going to do B, she's going to do C, and you're going to do D, and therefore I have to move here and move there, and I have to try to anticipate things 20 steps ahead. And, and matzah, by contrast, is what it is. It's what, it's what we're doing. I, I, you know, I remember when I uh, was marrying off my first son. And uh, after a while, you kind of get used to it. But there's all the tension of, 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 and the emotional tension and the financial and the, you know, y- y- you hope and pray that things should work out for the couple. And we're sitting there with the mechatonim like two nights before the chasana. And there's this whole issue of whether there should be the round potatoes or like the flat potatoes. And I feel like saying... What? This is what we're arguing about. A night before the chasana, you know? I, I said, I'll go out of my mind. I, I just like said, I don't know, round, flat, do whatever kind of potatoes you want. And I just, you know, got out of there. It was like, what's for you? You know? 
<laughs> so I told him, I, said, I can't believe this. The night before the castle, we're busy with what kind of potatoes or what kind of flowers or what kind of... So someone told me that Rabbi Yaakov once said that if we would really anticipate what's at stake when a couple gets married, we would go out of our minds in, 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 in fear. Parents would mamish... So what does the Kaddish Baruch do? So he distracts us with uh, fake flowers, real flowers. Uh, you want rice by the shmor, or those, what are they called, those frankfurters with the, with the things on it. You know, different uh, things. I never really understood. That's really a different shear. I don't want to get into it now. How come the shmorg is only by the ladies, not by the men, by the Kabbalah sponge? How come men get uh, sponge cake? <laughs> never understood. There must be an Indian. Men are going to be saying You know, this guy, he goes to the shmorg, and he's like, uh, he really wants those, what do they call those franks with the dough around? What are they called? What are they called? Franks and blanks. Frank, franks and blanks? Right. Whatever. Hush puppies. Hush puppies, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so this guy's like a real, you know, he has a velvet collar and he has black socks and he wears a peck shirt during the week. It doesn't go so good with the hush puppies, you know what I mean? But he really wants it. So he looks around, there's, there's like some grapes over there. So he figures, hey, I'll get these grapes and I'll put them onto the, Thing and and uh, he's holding two plates, and meanwhile he 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 you know he, he moves a lot of this Frank stuff on the, the lower plate. The top plate he has some grapes, and uh, the guy doing the videos he calls him over and says, "Udo, I got a good shot, you know, so I got a good clip for YouTube over here." And he shows him how the double plate is there with the Franks and blanks or hush puppies underneath, and you know, all of a sudden this guy goes, he said, "I said we have to ask her videos by Hassanis. It is unacceptable." <laughs> So it's almost like, if we would know what it's, what's at stake, we wouldn't be able to deal with it. So Kaddish Baruch Hu gives us distractions. We say to a kid, play with this now, it's okay, you know what I mean? And, and just like before a chasana, so we're busy with whatever it takes for the wedding. So it comes before Pesach. If we would know what's at stake when you sit down to that Seder, the whole Ruchni idea of who we are, we would go out of our mind. So Kaddish Baruch Hu says, okay, do this, be busy with this. And through this, you will be zaychet to what you have to be zaychet to. So now there's a lot of talk about the elections now in Eretz Yisrael, or lack of such, or whatever it means. Anyone can figure out how uh, Israeli elections work and the negotiations afterwards. But I had a Yerushalayim de Giyid who told me this story. He grew up in Yerushalayim, uh, Mamish all the way at the beginning, you know, 1949, early 50s. So he was telling me, that he says, you know, he grew up, Barilan wasn't even built yet. Okay? So it was just that, that section, you know, near Tzfania and that area there. And um, he said the Aguda was really trying to do their best. It may have even been the first election. So they went to the kids and they said, well, you know, we worked to try to help get votes for Gimel, for Aguda. And uh, what were the kids promised? They were promised to a pita. And you, you told one of these the kids that were literally starving to death. And they were also promised to get the ride in a taxi. I mean, now in Yishalayim, there's more taxis than there are, uh, you know. But the, that was a big thing, to ride in a taxi. Those old taxis with the, you know, the Mercedes with the light bulbs popped up on the, on the fenders. And uh, so he was so excited. His job was to go to nursing homes and bring old ladies, to, you know, from ladies, to be able to vote for Gimel. So meanwhile, the other parties got there as well, and they were doing their job. So he says that he got there to, uh, to the nursing home. And uh, he brings this old lady, he brings her to the polling station to vote. And he tells her to vote Gimel. So she says, no, nope, she's voting Kuf. He said, Kuf, that's the Communist Party. No, nope. but someone came and said, Kuf is Kedusha. So she's voting Kedusha, not Gimel. Gimel is Galuchim. So <laughs> she said, who told you that? This guy from the Communist Party came and told everyone that. So she went and she voted Kuf. Okay? So I said, what did you do? He said he left her there didn't take her back to the nursing home. <laughs> I said, you did what? <laughs> yeah, you know, she's like, I said, how could you do that? <laughs> he says, you know what other parties did? He said, there's other parties, I won't mention who, shouldn't be Lashon Har on them, maybe some mistress be Lashon Har on them. They came in, they said, are, are you voting Gimel? The guy said, no, he's voting, uh, uh, whatever he's voting for, he's voting for labor. So, and, I, and I demand you take me now legally and to vote for labor. So he says he takes the guy out, takes him to a mailbox, and he, he puts in this thing in a regular mailbox. Says, okay, you voted. You see, I voted. Yeah, you voted. He said it's okay. <laughs> okay. So I was just thinking, Gimel is Kuf, Kuf is Gimel. You think we are smarter? You think we know what's going on in our life? 
where we are and who we are. I heard this story, everything Rabbi Spiro says it, it's just a great story, that uh, this guy is becoming a Balchuva, and they tell him the story in Kanemias, where they took upon themselves to be Shem Shemitah, and the locusts devoured everything, around and around. The only thing they did not devour was in Kanemias. So he said, that's strange. So my father grew up in Kanemias. I never heard that story. So he calls his father, who's a real Neretz, you know, uh, goes to sleep in red pajamas and wakes up, you know, everything is red. And uh, he says to him, Did, is that story with Kanemias true? He says, yeah, yeah. He says, a matter of fact, when he was in school, the schools were all brought. They should see it. I said, so like, why? Why did you become from? How could you like... He says, his headmaster said, you see the Charedim? Everyone hates them. Even the locusts don't want to go there. <laughs> right? So you could take everything. You could touch it up any way where you are. Part of the inyanim of Pesach is that we're not so smart. We're not trying to figure out what's going to be or who we are. We're trying to figure out right now, at this moment, what do you want me to do? That's the difference in Matzah and that's the difference in Chalas. And I heard this story about Rebbe Yashu's Chalabach and about Rebbe Yosef. We've mentioned it before. But it's just a fascinating idea. It's a very heated election. And they felt that, you know, the future of Torah and money and Moses, so they, they were very involved in the day-in, day-out uh, politics. Do this, move this way, move that way. And everybody was all geared up for what's going to be by this election. And so much was riding on it. And it came the day of the election. So they came to Rebbe Yashu to tell him who won. He goes, no, he's not learning it. He said, for the last three months, you are cucking him, cucking your hair. I just want to tell you who won. I got the one here. It's middle learning. It's middle diary. So he explained, till now, that he felt that was his mitzvah. He had to guide what should be done, what Das Tire was. Who won? It's really not Negea. At this point, I, you know, now it's Bethel Tire already. Now I'm sitting and learning. Right? What does that mean? It means that all along he was baking matzah. He wasn't here to prove I'm right. He wasn't here to, to zet somebody else being wrong. It wasn't politics. It was, what does the Rabbi Nisham want me to do right now? Rabbi Shraga and the Lovitch used to quote Rabbi Yisrael Salanta, used to say like this, Bedavtan nisht oiftan, Bedavtan nisht optan, Bedavtan nisht fartan. And he, he, uh, I'll give you a free translation. He says, you have to get out there and you have to do. Tan, nisht oiftan. Don't try to accomplish. Just do what you have to do. Whether you accomplish or not, that's not up to you. Same is true for your attempt at Shalom Bayis. Same is true at your attempt for Chinuch Habanim. It, it, no, it doesn't see anywhere you have to have good kids. It doesn't see anywhere you have to have Shalom Bayis. It doesn't see anywhere you have to learn. It doesn't see anywhere you have to daven. You have to get out there and try to do these things. Get out, you got to get out there. I'm, I don't want to say it doesn't see anywhere you have to daven. You know what I mean to say. You have to get out there and you have to say to Rabbi I am doing my best. And if it doesn't work, you wake up the next morning. Then it's not political. Then you do what you have to do. But that ton nisht up ton. You're not supposed to do it to try to show the guy, ha ha, and I did it. Do it. But that ton nisht far ton. Sometimes we get so involved in our scumness that we forget what we're trying to accomplish. And we forget that we're, we're baking matzah, that we're working for the divine Islam. So the Velt says such a vart that uh, a bunch of, I uh, read this someplace, that uh, you know, a bunch of Hasidim were traveling to the Rebbe, and the horse died in the middle. Kaplonk, horse died. So, uh, as the wagon driver went to find the new horse, there was a whole chakira whether the horse was a chassid or a misnagid. So, some tainted the horse was a misnagid because he didn't want them to go to the Reb. And others tainted, no, the horse was a chassid. Well, at Gewalt Veren, Ois Fered. You wanted to be no more horse. You wanted to be something else. <laughs> but I think that that's, it's not a proper uh, interpretation. Because if the Rebbe made us a fed, then that's who we are. Uh, uh, the, the idea is, like the Rebbe of Zisha used to say, my father used to share with me, they're not going to hit me that I'm not a Ram Avinu. They're going to hit me that I'm not Zisha. And our attitude in life has to be, I am who I am, I can do what I can do, this is my situation, whether it's my fault or not that I got into this situation, fine, but right now, as of today, this is who I am, and I will do my best. I will bake matzah. What's going to be, I don't know. Today is the yard site of Rav Moshe Nalshlas was the Rav in square, not the rabbi, he was the rabbi in square, and uh, he was he had a tremendous Talmud Chacham, an Ish Kaddish, and he went through uh, the war. So he said this story, I think, that uh, during the war, he was in Sarah the Hell in Hungary, they took the entire town, and they walked him up, and they made them dig a pit, and they made everyone get undressed. That's it, there's going to be a mass yard site over here. And they, they stood there with their machine guns, and the Germans wanted to 
amused themselves. So they said, who's the rabbi? And he picked up his hand. They, the, they said to him, Rabbi, hold your last sermon. Hold your last drasha. And as long as you talk, we won't shoot anybody. It was like, let's see how long he can talk. You know, as soon as he stopped the drasha, boom. And the people were saying, don't do it, don't do it, they're going to kill us anyway, they're just trying to... And he started dashing and the parish like, you know, I, you know, and they're holding the machine guns. And they're going, stop already, stop, let them kill us, you know. Now, I once said this story, somebody said, well, I would rather get shot than have to listen to my rabbi speech. You know, that, this was not, this was Aaron's, the people there, right? There's, all the families are standing, and waiting to be shot, and he's going on and on, and they're going, stop already, this is going on, and he says the whole perky, obviously, he says the whole zayin, he says the whole tilim, and it goes, yeah, I'll have us, uh, you know, I'll have us chaveri, and he starts reading off the whole telephone book, I don't know what, he just keeps going, and they're like laughing, and all of a sudden, they turn around, there's no Germans there. And it turned out that the, uh, all of a sudden, someone came running and said that the Yankees are around the corner. And they all took off and ran for their lives. So they asked him, how did you know that was going to happen? He says, he didn't. He was sure he was going to be killed. But he wanted to come up to Shemayim saying, I did whatever I could. And if they gave me this loophole, and if they gave me this opportunity, and said, try to push it off, I tried to push it off. He said, I didn't think it was going to happen. I didn't think we were going to be saved. But who says you have to make chametz with the zechesh? It's not going to work anyway, and it's not going to be placed anyway. So he may as well do what you have to do. Do what you have to do. So Moshe Nashlas had a yeshiva after the war, and he came to. Uh, yeah, Emnif was in Hungary or even in America, maybe in America. And he once went to the Satmar Rav. He said he had some of the bacharim he has to send out. There, terrible influence on the other. Satmar Rebbe was very against sending away bacharim. So the Satmar Rebbe said to him, "I have a very good idea for you." He says, "Send out the good bacharim." Because if you send out the bad bachim, they're going to wind up on the street. Send out the good bachim, they'll find themselves the yeshiva, keep the bad bachim. So suffice it to say, he didn't send anyone out. He, uh, he was a tremendous master. He sat and learned hours and hours and hours on end. And uh, his brother, who lived in Williamsburg, thought that he was killed in the war. This story, he thought that they were all killed. And it was only like a year or two, they stayed in Hungary after the war. So it took years till he realized his brother was alive. And he traveled to Hungary to meet him. And when they saw each other, he, he said, let's learn. What? Like, you know, my brother was supposed to be dead, you're alive after five years? I, no, no emotion. The opened up Gemara, it was Erev Shabbos, they learned for five hours. After five hours, they embraced each other and started crying. So he, he was saying, like, let, let, let's not get, let's not let the emotions control our lives. Let, let's understand who we are. Some say that his feeling always was, right after the war, he grabbed the Gemara and sat down to start to learn. He said, there's so little Torah in the world, What's going to uh, protect the world? Some say that he was Yadi Yisach Azul in arrangement with that person after the war. They didn't want to be a mevatel. But I think there's another Nakuda over here. It was like, I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. Oh no, we're dead. Oh, my parents were killed. We're the only ones that are alive. Why, why, why go through it? Let's do what we have to do now. I think that was the Gvura over here. Sit down and learn for five hours. And then, you know, and then we'll, we'll, we'll fall on each other. Then we'll hug each other. So it's a very interesting medrash in this week's parsha. The medrash says that Jews, they really know how to ask for things. Okay? That the guy knocks on the door, and he said, the woman says, I, I don't have time for you. What, what do you need? An onion. Just an onion. I don't have, I, don't have, I can't give you lunch now. So you're four pesos. An onion. Fine. Here's an onion. He goes, an onion? And no bread? Oh, just bread. Just, okay, here's a piece of bread. He goes, an onion and bread and no drink? Okay, his drink, fine. Because an onion and bread and, 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 and a drink outside. Okay, come inside, you know. In the end, he winds up eating a Suda Shlom of So the, the Medrash um, equates that. <coughs> it says a Klal Yisrael does. Yoim li yoim yabiya oimer. We take it day by day. We say to Hashem, okay, day by day. But day by day, I know we, we did so many terrible affairs. Day by day, can you deal with us? Okay, for a day I can deal with you. Shagiyah is miyavin, can you be moichel me on the affairs b'shaygik? Okay, fine. Ministores nakenu, when I hid and I did thought, and they believe like you don't see me, Hashem, fine, you know that also. Oh, gami zaydin, what about the affairs that did the nezid? Okay. Uh, in the case of me, pasha rav, what about when I rebelled against you? And that's how we do it. So it's interesting, there's a Gemara, a chayr where the Gemara comes from the opposite angle. The Gemara tells us about a Tana, I think it was a Tana, named Plimi. Was it a Tana? Was it a Mara? Was it a Tana? Plimi? I think it was a Tana. And he used to say, Gira b'yanecha Satan. Satan, I'm not scared of you. An arrow in your eyes. You know, you know, you know one of the people you don't start up with is a Satan. Let's just, you know, let him do his thing, you do your thing. So one day, it's Erev Yom Kippur, someone knocks on his door. It's a piece of bread. Yeah, he goes, everyone's inside, I'm outside, come in. 
goes, everyone's sitting up front, and I'm sitting to the back. Okay, come up close. Everyone's like uh, sitting mamish next to you. I'm like close. Okay, you're sitting even on, and I'm not. Okay, you have the best food, and I don't. Okay, fine. And finally, he starts like doing all sorts of very not nice things, and he's like you know vomiting and grabbing things and touching things. And so please said, well, "What are you doing?" He goes, ah, "You embarrassed me. You embarrassed me." And he goes, he collapses. He's dead. And the word got out. Oh, please, he murdered someone. He had to run for his life. And uh, he's chasing him down, and finally he meets him. He says, listen, I'm the Satan. Because he goes, what do you want from me? He says, don't say, Gira be'enecha Satan. So if he saw Salanter as a whole uh, explanation on this Gemara, that's what the Yetzirah does. First he knocks on the door, he says, just a piece of bread, give me just, you know, the guy's looking at something on his iPod, just peek over his shoulder. You would never do it. You have to, know, you have to tell his Meshgiach what he's doing, so if you don't see what he's doing, how are you going to say, hey, this again? So you know, a little bit, and a little more, a little more, a little more, and that's how he lets you in. So the Chayra, it's the same concept, but it's going in different directions, and the answer is yes. The concept of matzah goes in different directions. And that's why I said the Sabbath Rabbi, that's the meaning of Baitkin Esachamitz. He has a very novel understanding in Badika's Chamitz. When it comes to dealing with your taiva, yes, yeah, soon, soon. Yeah, I'll give it to you soon, soon. Just, just now, right now. Yeah, I'll push off. No, 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 I don't have patience to learn. One Mishnah? Okay, one Mishnah. Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. Always say it to kids. I don't have patience to sit and learn. Everyone has patience. The question is for how long? One person has patience for 20 minutes. One person has patience for 20 hours. One person has patience for 20 seconds. If your limit is 20 seconds, learn for 20 seconds. I, I do it to myself all the time. I come home. My father used to teach it to me. Maybe you go to sleep. You learn something before you go to sleep. Ah, I'm so tired. For a minute? Okay, for a minute. You know, every time you open the safe, you look inside, you start, you stop watching, you know, so you don't stop after a minute. You trick in. You trick your way in. You, you gotta use this kayach in two ways. You have to be by the, what you're doing with the chametz. When it comes to the Yitzhahara, yeah, push them off. Yeah, 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 tomorrow, tomorrow. When it comes to positive, little by little. I used to do it in class. You know, when I taught eighth, eighth grade, the Shahin Kedach, I'm just joking. But when I taught eighth grade, so the kids would have a after two seconds they were finished. I said, guys, this is the way it goes. I'm setting my stopwatch, okay? You have to stand Shmanesser for four minutes, which is not considerably a very long time, but for eighth graders, it's a long time. I said, no one, the, the, the Baltzvilla is not starting till after five minutes. Four minutes is your Shmanesser, you have one minute to loosen up a little bit. So be it as it may be, you're all going to stand in one place for five minutes. Okay, so it's like, you know, they have those highways, there's no speeding cops, but there's no exits. And if you get there too quick, you get a ticket. So when you get there, you have, everyone's lined up along the side of the road waiting for the clock to change so they can pass through. But eventually people stop speeding, because what's the point? So I, I noticed that slowly the kids started davening. They resigned themselves. I'm here for five minutes. They slowly, slowly started to daven. Move yourself in one, move in the right direction. That's what matzah means. But what's the point? Yeah, I'm going to start learning. So I'll learn a mission a night. Yeah, I'll learn five minutes a night before I go to sleep. I mean, that's going to make me a better person. Who cares what it makes you? That's the Yitzhahar of Chametz. Do what you have to do. Swing at the pitch that's coming toward you. Now, Shlom Kavzavil used to say as follows. He said, a person's going to come up to Shemayim after 120 years, they're going to say, what do you bring us? Love of Hashem. Love of Hashem? Huh, look at all these malachim. A trillion times more love than you. You drown in their love. I, Yira Shemayim. Yira, look at those malachim. Whoa, he's going to burn up. So what did you bring me from this world? And the answer is, what we can bring Hashem is Shvira Saratzen. That we broke our Ratzen for the sake of Hashem. That we can say on a given day, there is something I wanted to do, that I was driven to do, that I may have even had some kind of a, like, you know, natural feel to want to do it, and I held myself back because I know Hashem doesn't want me to do it. Whether it's what I ate, whether it's what I looked at, whether it's what I listened to, whether it's what I said, there's something that I did. Whether I forced myself to set my stopwatch and say I'm standing Shmon Esrei for four minutes for five minutes, whatever it is and all the malachim open up their mouth wide and they say, wow you broke your rod sign you didn't let the Yetzirah say, what's the point I'm not going to be the tzaddik anyway you just did at that moment what you were supposed to do and that's why it says in regard to the carbon mincha nefesh ki sakriv Kaddish Baruch Hu says, he brings his flower but that's all he has to bring for me he was makriv his 
Nefesh. So there's a story that they came to the Baal Shem Tov, a certain town, and they said, we're in big trouble with the pirates, can you give us a bracha, can you tell us what to do? The Baal Shem Tov said, go to so-and-so, in this and this town. They went to so-and-so, they asked for the big tzaddik so-and-so, they said, there's no big tzaddik so-and-so, there is a shikr so-and-so. And yeah, it must be a lamed of tzaddik. And they find him, and he's rolling on the floor, vomiting in his thing, and his bottles all around the place, he's getting up, he's collapsing, he's getting up, he's collapsing, that's the shikr. And they grab him, they hold him down, they sober him up by locking him to a fence for 12 hours. And uh, he says, you know, uh, give, me, give us a bracha, give us a bracha, give us a bracha! He gives them a bracha, and the bracha is fulfilled. So they said to the Vashem, to like, what's the story with this guy? Vashem to said, this man uh, was over the worst of areas in the world. And once he took a huge sum of money that he saved up, and he was going to employ a... Um, not a good thing, to be in not a good situation. He basically was going to be over, over the worst of air in the world with someone, and as he's about to take this money, and he's about to step into wherever, and this yid comes by and says, please, please, my son needs an operation, the doctor won't give it to me, I don't have a penny to my name, he needs it within an hour, and he just takes all the money and gives it away. So Shemayim, there was a murder in Gerachka. All the malachim started, and they said to the malachim, well, what do you know? Did you ever have such a taiva? Did you ever take your money? Were you ever so low you were taking your money to buy this taiva and you gave it away to tzedakah? It was a big rash. And they decided that he has a kayach of bracha. Same with said, Not him. It'll be a chal Hashem. So the pshara was, they're going to make him shikr. He'll have this tremendous taiva to be drunk. And mainly he'll never have a chance to use out the bracha. So the Hashem says, from time to time, I try to chap him around where he is. It's, it's this moment in our life that we are at our lowest of the low. And we say, Rabbi Nishalaylam, no, I'm not going to be a tzaddik. I'm, I'm not going to get my picture. You know what I mean? On posters. I'm not going to be, no one is going to say, me, you know, Boiberic Kartstrimp. I'm the guy. Donate money to Vada Ir and you'll see a picture of me putting money into the tzaddikah pushkin for you. No one is going to do that. I'm going to be a nothing shiva nothing. But you know what? Here I am in the dumps, in the mud. And Rabbi I don't know what's going to be tomorrow. Right now, I'm not going to look at that. Right now, I'm not going to do it. And the Rabbi Nishalem says, you don't know what Kayach of Bracha. You have just generated for yourself, for future Dairis, where you are. At this given moment. Nefesh Kisakri. So Bi'etzem, that is the Indian that the night of the Seder is basically divided in two. Until Chatzais and after Chatzais. The concept of Til Chatzais is, I have to do what I have to do. I, I don't care who I, this is who I am, I gotta do with it. I gotta work with it. After Chatzais, I resign myself. Okay, Rabbi Hashem, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. The Seder is Mesadr the Ruchnius for the entire year, for wherever it's going to be. Um, you know, you go outside and you buy yourself a Cadillac, right? That used to be the fancy car before. Uh, used to say, I have a Seville. You know, a Seville Fortis, a Seville Fortis. You drive it out of the showroom, it decreases in value. They say that you buy a brand new car, you drive it out of the showroom, there's nothing that you can buy that depreciates so quickly. Now it's a used car. Every tithe in this world depreciates. When you break a tithe, you're appreciating. You're appreciating something. You are building in Shemayim a Kayach of Rachel. Now, here's the trick. We have to know when to swing at the pitch, and we have to know when to say, to Hashem, I resign myself to the situation, I accept it. The Chesam Soifer says, a person that's really not in a good matzav, and he says, okay, Bari Yerlam, you put me here, this is where I am, I'm in your hands, Savlon is Echad, is Doichem Neyet Filas, is more powerful than a hundred Filas. Even Zariah from Purim, the one Yidin accepted their situation, that overcame all the Filas that were beforehand. And that's the avoid of the Seder night. Until Chatzais, swing at the first pitch. I gotta do it. The clock is ticking. I gotta be who I am. I gotta eat matzah the way I eat matzah. I have to eat mara the way I eat mara. I have to... <coughs> I have to say that God, whatever kayak I have, given all the Nesiyanis around me. After Chatzais, okay, Rabbi Shalom, this is who I am, I'm in your hands. You have to be able to break it up into two. And that's the Indian of Yachatz also. Now, I'm not very good with Yachatz. Yachatz is a disaster in my house. The kids all laugh. The Enoch all laugh. I never manage to break the matzah into two. Either it breaks into three, or it crumbles, or one part goes flying across I think. And I, just, I just don't do it. You know the guy that said that uh, thing? There was this guy, he made a top secret fighter plane for the Israeli um, Air Force. 
So first they said it, it wasn't taking off the ground because there were too many plaques on it, you know, from all the people that donated money. And afterwards they finally got the plaques off. They said the plane was taking off, and the wing kept, from the pressure, kept flying off, kept flying off. So the guy had to parachute to safety. Finally, they said, we'll give you one more chance. He goes to all the engineers. They don't know why it's happening. He goes to his rav. Can you give me a bracha? The rav says, go, go before the wing and drill holes. Holes along the, between the fuselage and the wing and see what happens. doesn't make any sense uh, from an uh, aerodynamics uh, perspective, but he'll try it. And the plane takes off. He goes, what happened? Because I've been trying to break the matzah by yachats for years. It doesn't go. I know when it has these holes, it doesn't break off. You'll see. Try to do it. <laughs> this is where you are. <laughs> so we're told to break the matzah by chatzais and to put away the bigger piece after chatzais. And that is the remis. Before chatzais is, the Bible says, I have to do what I have to do. I can't sit back and say, it's not working anyway. It didn't work till now. I've got to do what I have to do. Whether it's shalom bias, whether it's coping with life, whether it's parna, I got to do what I have to do, and that's it. Whatever happens, happens. And then sit back and enjoy the ride. And that's why after chutzais, the bigger piece you put back for after chutzais, because really it's much less what you have to do. Most of what happens is to what comes afterwards. You know that famous story that they say that um, they say to the person. <coughs> Uh, okay, guy, uh, he's applying, he wants to be in the Navy. So they say to him, well, he wants to be a captain of the ship. They say, so what are you going to do if there's a terrible storm? Drop an anchor. What if there's a hurricane afterwards? Drop an anchor. What if there's a typhoon? Drop an anchor. What if there's a tornado? Drop an anchor. He goes, young man, where are you getting all these anchors from? And he says, and where are you getting all these storms from? You know what I mean? <laughs> there's an anchor for every storm. That's it. You have the chashvainas. I have to get out there and I have to try. Now, um, there's a Mayur de Gavart in the Divri you saw from the Majid Sarebah. I said this, someone said that Rav Melech Bidim said it. That's always a problem, because then uh, I have to quote Rav Melech Bidim. Not no problem quoting him, but it's like, you know, he's the one I was listening to. So actually, I, this, this Vart I grabbed the soul before he said it. There used to be a thing called the Yiddish Vart. Everyone used to read the Vart from it. But uh, so it was like the, the guy walked in, this Reb is coming into a tish or a rub, and he's looking at the Yiddish of Art, this magazine that comes out. He goes, That's where you get your Dvar Tires from? He goes, No. Here's where I read it to know what not to say. Because I'm going to say over a Kedushas Levi, or I'm going to say uh, Maranayim. He's going to say, Oh, I took it from me. It was this. I have to see what he brought down to know what not to say. Okay. So he puts it away, then he takes that one from three years ago. What's that? <laughs> now I'm preparing my uh, Tyre, he says. Now I'm doing it. Okay. So, um, so he says like this. The, the Marjus Tereva says that the end of Shemais ends L'Eine Kolbeis Yisrael B'chal Masein. And how does Vayikra start? Vayikra starts with a small aleph. L'Eine Kolbeis Yisrael B'chal Masein. Wherever you are in your life, wherever you are traveling, everything is Bajgacha Pratis. What your Nesayin is at this given moment. Whether, whether this watch is here, or this phone is here, or I'm sitting next to these people, whatever's going on in your house at night, whatever's on your heart, whatever mixture of emotions you are challenged with at this moment between anxiety and hope and so on, my life is in your hands at this given moment. It is all Bashgacha Pratis. And the reason of a Yikra is a small Aleph, to show even the little things in your life. Everything is coordinated 100%. You know, they say that these, these two guys, they walk into a bar, sit down next to each other. One of them says, where are you from? Jerusalem. Oh, me too. Where do you live? Near the King David Hotel. Oh, me, me too, really. Came to America, where did you go? To Brooklyn College. Really, me too. When did you graduate? 90. Me too. Wow. You know, my father passed away last year. My father also. What day? Kim Alada. Me too. Wow. You know, my birthday is Chav Chesed. Me too. And the bartender says, the Goldberg twins, they're too many L'chaim, they're going at it again tonight. <laughs> You know, we say, wow, can you imagine? Pink dye was by this person, by this place. Trust me. There's nothing that takes place by chance. In your traveling through this world, as you're coming toward Pesach, by Yikras, they were a small aleph. Every last Nakoda is Behashgach and Nefla. It doesn't have to be your twin brother. But who you are with and what you're in the Siyanis are, where, what, and when is all Behashgach. I think today's the Yard said, Asar Shanira. She had a little tailor shop. And that's how she started teaching. She was teaching girls in the back of her shop. They said, what are you doing? It's over. You know, Yiddishkeit is over, especially girls' chinuch was a disaster. It's a sinking ship. And she said that I'll, and maybe the, the, the ship will sink, but I'll know I did what I had to do. She used to combine rags, and she combined them and made little dresses out of them. She said, we've got to take what we have. This is what the Kaddish Baruch Hu gave us to work with, and slowly the Vesiyakov movement started to build and build and build. And she had many misnagdim. 
and, and once she was walking at someone, uh, Kanoi, threw a brick at her head. And she took that brick and she says, save it. I want it to be the Evan Apina, the cornerstone for the first place Yaakov building. She said, this is the challenge, this is my Nisayim. Somebody told me that during the war, they had gone through Krakow, and the Germans were forcing the, this unit of Jews, this Hungarian labor battalion, to, to I don't know if Hungarian labor battalion was in Poland, but something like that, to, to break up the Matzevois, break up the, 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 the tombstones, and to build roads with it. And they tried to hit this tombstone, they didn't see whose it was, and the hammer kept smashing, and the anvil kept smashing. And the German was so angry, he tried doing it, it smashed. He finally said, okay, just stay away from this one. He said the Jews risked their lives to run back. It was a terrible storm. And they wiped the mud off to see whose, whose, whose cave was this that had this chus. It was the cave of Sarah the, the You know what it means, the Shemayim? If you take that brick that's thrown at your head and say, okay, it was beshared to me to throw it at my head, I'll take it and I'll build with it. I'll do what I can. I know a year when I was in Melbourne, there was someone that he was, the Germans forced him to go cemetery to cemetery and destroy the Matzevois and to break it down in such a way that they could build roads with it. And he came there and he said, let me do something. And he went all around town. He found broken pieces of concrete or wherever they were digging up the sidewalk. He said, don't throw it into the dump truck. He took it and he built the first mikveh with it. He said, this is my revenge. I'm not going to get depressed. I'm going to take it and do what I can with it. You know, there was another safe. It used to be, at least in my days, it was called Mayana Shal Torah. Uh, originally, you remember the, the white Mayana Shal Torah? Right, the white ones? Right, so there was, there was the first safe that had like little Dvar Torahs in the center. It was like, if you said a Dvar Torah that happened to be there, oh, you looked in the Mayan Shal <laughs> It was written by Rabbi Alexander Zisha Friedman, who was a himself in the Krakow ghetto. It was originally written in Yiddish. So let me tell you what I saw in the Mayan Shal He quotes from Rameir Shapiro. He Zaharu bi Aniyim, be careful with Aniyim. Shemehem Tetzei Torah. He says like this. And on he goes and he has to pay Schar Limit. You know how hard it is to pay schar limit. You know what comes before Pesach. You know what hard it is people are paying schar limit. They're going, they're trying, they're, they're on their hands and feet. The Rebbe Shem says, look what he's doing. To be mechanach his children. Do you, know, he, you know how hard it is? Public school is for free. He says, he zaru be'aniyim, the schus that they have. Shemihem teitzitar. So this, I thought I heard from Amalek. Listen carefully, I heard that one also. Dabra Amalek says, avar ches Hashem b'chal eis, tamit hilasay b'fi. So what happened? David Melch says to Hashem, I saw this deranged person walking. And he's like drooling and he's wandering from side to side. And the kids are throwing things at him. Why don't you create such people for? So Hashem said, Chayecha, you're going to be mispal to be one. Anyway, Shaul's trying to kill him. He runs away to the land of the Pelishtim. He comes to Achish Melech Gas, and he happens to notice that Achish's security guard, the head of his security, happens to be the brother of Goliath who would have a score to settle with David. And he sees David, he goes to Achish, can I kill him? And, and uh, David says, oh boy, am I in trouble. And David says, Hashem, please, please, make me crazy. L- let me look like I'm crazy. And all of a sudden, David like, starts drooling, and he's like, he's, like, he's a Meshugana, and his, his, uh, Achish says, you sure that's David? I'm telling you that's David, let me kill him, he killed my brother. That's David? Yeah. And he watches him, and David goes running over, and he starts banging on the door, and he's screaming. He goes, Achish's wife owes me 150,000 dinner in, and his daughter owes me 150. Bang, bang, he's screaming. You know, guy banging on the White House door, screaming, smashing his head in. And he's saying, you know, the president owes me money. If he was a Secret Service driving into the door, that would be normal. That's accepted already. But he's a regular person. He's screaming, bang, 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 or they had become crazy. So they were inside screaming their heads off. David was outside screaming his heads off. Och says, Chassar Meshagoyim, I don't have enough of my own Meshagoyim, get him out of here! And they, they, they take David away from here, and David's life is safe. So he says, okay, Hashem, now that, Mepharshim explained, that doesn't answer the question, why Hashem created people in this matzah. It just throws David, not everything do you understand. And here he says, Avor Hashem Bechol Eis. Can there be anyone in a worse situation that he's acting like a madman, drooling, screaming, yelling, banging, and being carried away as a, in a straitjacket, and a Kashbar who is saving his life. So, what I see from here is even in the worst moments of my life, even where it looks like I'm hopping such busyness, even where it looks like I'm being so distracted, I'm being so hurt, the Rav Hashem has a cheshbon, that you have to be where you are now. Pick up the pieces and go with it. And that's why it goes through the whole Aleph base. Goes through the whole Aleph base, the, the Avarach Hashem Mechalais, in every matziv in our life. Now, getting back to the original question, 
You know, when you want to pass a bill in Congress or in the Assembly, you try to pass the bill. It's not so easy. You have to get the head of the committee to bring the bill to the table to get a vote on it. Let's say it's not going. The bill fails. There's an old trick how you can sneak any bill through. How do you sneak any bill through? Does anyone know? The trick is you put it in the budget. And you say you want to approve the budget? Okay. Let's say, let's say I want a bill, Yechweis, I want the government to pass uh, subway trains for Anchorage, Alaska. I did only subway trains. That's what I want. Congress doesn't want to vote on it. Okay. Here's the whole budget, right? Everyone wants the budget to be approved. And part of the budget is subway trains for Anchorage, Alaska. Or saving the white moose in Bar Park or something. Whatever, whatever this congressman decides. Okay? Now, he says, what are you crazy? We're not funding that. And the whole budget. Take that out of the budget. No, can't take it out of the budget. Right? That's what they're doing now, right? If you don't want to fund the president's immigration bill, we're not funding Homeland Security. We linked the two together. You don't like my immigration bill? There's no Homeland Security. You don't pass the budget? Ooh, because of you Republicans, America is all right, right? You know, they're stuck, right? Rosh Hashanah, we're all judged for who we are. The bill comes up. Comes before Pesach, there's a different trick. Put it in the budget. Yeah, I blew it. I have to buy matzahs. The Lord said, I blew it. I need, you gave me a Pesach. I need new money. I'm doing what I can. I'm putting it in the budget. So, Mamele, you have to give me the Parnassi. You have to give me the Chizik. I'm slipping it in the budget. It's a whole different Cheshvin. It works completely differently. It's in a different matzif. There was a, there was a, um, Enikel, or, or, not an or a relative of the Chavetz Chaim, came to visit the Chavetz Chaim. Chavetz Chaim was very old then. And he had traveled very far. And he came to the house. He was like, Zankt, so the, one of the Chavetz Chaim's children gave him a bed to sleep, and he goes down, he goes, Ah, oh, I remember I didn't have Marv. What do I do? He goes, Ah, Tfilis Arvis Rishus. Marv is, is, is voluntary. It's not really voluntary today, it's considered a chay, but it's originally voluntary. Hold over to bed. And he sleeps, then there's the big Z's. And why, why, why is there Z's when someone snores? You're a cartoonist, no? What does that have to do with Zin? <laughs> I've heard many different kinds of snoring. Never heard and Z. I don't know. It must be. Maybe it's like, you know, you do Excel, you sort from A to Z. It's like at the end of the day, you go to sleep, Z. Shem is sorting out your life, okay? So the guy wakes up in the morning, goes, Where was I up to, Amar? You know, like, forget about that one. So finally, the Chavetz Chaim will see him. He comes into the Chavetz Chaim, and the Chavetz Chaim tells him, You know, Tfilis Arvis is Taka Rishos, but not Bizman Hazeh. Bizman Hazeh, when it's so dark, Phyllis Iris is the main field. Of course, the guy went through the floor. The, the night of Pesach is the night. It's Laila Kiyayim Yoyer. It's a flash where we say, Rabbi Nishalayla, I don't deserve it, but I want to slip it into the budget. I'm alive, you're giving me life, this is what I have to do. And the, the, the calculation of before Chatzais and after Chatzais is a very, very difficult one. And we try to do it right. The Maranayim says that Vayikra has a small aleph. Hashem is calling you. Okay? A guy's about to watch something that he shouldn't watch. You're in the office. And you walk over to the computer. Your computer has a filter on it, but the guy next door doesn't. And you look to your right, and you look to your left, and you go online, you check again, going, and all of a sudden, boom, the door opens. Your wife was passing by, she came to visit, brought you a lunch. No! You don't know why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing it to me? Why is Hashem doing it to you? Hashem just saved your life. Pink then she walks in. No, 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 no. That's the small aleph of a yikra. And that's me'oyel moyed. From the Kotshe Kodeshim, they call down from Shemayim to have Rachmanis on you. Sometimes we don't read it, says the Maranayim. The little aleph, see, you know, this is not the Rebbe Nishlam. This is just stuck in a traffic jam. No, you are where you are supposed to be. But I'm in the worst possible situation. Hashem is calling me from the oil moyed? Yeah. The power of bracha may be when you're in your lowest moment in your life and you're giving it away. We've often said the word vayikra or kara can have three meanings. Kara with an aleph means to call. Kara with an ayin means to rip. And vayikar means a happening. It just happened. We, we tend, when something doesn't go our way, we say it's just happening. The world is hefker. If you focus on it for a moment, you say, no, it's a calling. Hashem is calling me. And when you're willing to subject yourself to Hashem's will, then Vayikra, then, it, then, then, then you rip up all the Xeras. Just by saying, I am who I am. Please help me go where I can. You know, somebody once said, somebody told me they were expanding a certain shul. And it was very expensive. A guy cut up, he said he has an idea. If anybody would do banding, you wouldn't have to expand the shul, he said, because there would be so much more place on the inside. They didn't like that joke. 
But think about this. If we would all say, tell me what my role is in life. You know how many machlokes know what's that? I don't have to be right. I don't have to be wrong. I don't have to have a scorecard. Tell me. It doesn't make us what I did. It doesn't make us what's going to happen. Tell me what to do now. When you do that, the Rabbi Shalom says, come over here. And that's the Kayach of Pesach. More so than Tishrei. The Kedushas Levi explains. You know, everyone knows when you delete something on a computer, is it really deleted? No. So they say that it becomes so pitsy and small that you can't see it. But uh, trust me, you know, the government agencies know how to find something after it's deleted. The, 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 you can't, even if you accidentally delete something, you can't really make it disappear from the computer. Except the IRS's emails, whatever, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> that, that, that was found as well. That was found as well. You can't make something disappear on the computer. It's there, it's always there. So, you do tshuva meyira, okay, you bring it down from a mezid to a shaygeg, you bring it down from a shaygeg to a, to a mamash and oinus, but it's still there. Tshuva meyahava turns an aver into a mitzvah. Pesach has a kayach that Rosh Hashanah doesn't have. On Rosh Hashanah you could delete. On Pesach you could, ex- it's called expunge. It doesn't exist anymore. Not only doesn't it exist, but it is converted to bracha. It's converted to bracha. It's an entirely different situation. There's a beautiful story in the Torah and Tavlin I saw, and I'm going to end with this, because I think it wraps, it just explains it so beautifully. There was a, there was a chuppah, and they wanted to invite Rav Rudiman to be the, to be the Masada the Kedushin. They wanted to invite uh, Rav Rudiman to be the Masada the Kedushin, and uh, they, uh, the Bachar asked his Rosh Hashiva, and Rosh Hashiva said, not available that night. Okay? So the father was very close to Rav Moshe. So he asked Rav Moshe. Then all of a sudden, a week before the chastan, Rav Rudim didn't know they asked Rav Moshe. He said, guess what? Change the schedule, I can come. And he only asked Rav Moshe to be inside the condition. So the Bacha said, my Rosh Hashiva can come. He said, I asked Rav Moshe. I'm not telling Rav Moshe, no, you're taking it back. He said, we have to. He's crying. The Bacha means so much to Rav Hashiva. So fine. So you go to Rav Moshe and tell him. Okay? He's not inside the condition anymore. So I'll tell him my Rosh Hashiva. He'll go tell him. Like knocks on the door. And Rav Moshe opens up. He sees the chasen. And the guy's like, Chacham Adif me Navi. So Ramosha says to him, I know your father, I'm coming as a friend, I don't need to say the Kedushan. He didn't even have to say that. Ramosha saw on his face what he wanted to say. Rav Rudiman is sitting there, and Rav Moshe comes in, the Messiah the Kedushan. So Rav Rudiman says to Rav Moshe, You're the Messiah of the Kedushan. Rav Moshe says, No, you're the Messiah of the Kedushan. Back and forth, back and forth. And then somebody asked me, well, The waiter is not going to do it. Well, well, you know. So uh, finally, Rav Rudiman says uh, to Rav Moshe, you're older, so you're the Masada Kedushin, and that's it. So Rav Moshe says, I'm older, so I, so, so, milk came to come, you're right, okay. So if I'm older, I'm commanding you to be Masada Kedushin, you have to listen to me because I'm older. Okay. So, so they take out the Ksuvah, so Rav Rudin gives Rav Moshe the Ksuvah to fill out. He goes, but you're the Masada Kedushin. He says, I'm the Masada Kedushin, I decide what goes. <laughs> I'm saying, you fill out the Ksuvah. <laughs> so what's really happening? Each one is saying, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking for brownie points. I'm looking to do what the Rabbi Nishan wants me to do. What the Rabbi Nishan wants me to execute. I'm looking for that covet. I'm looking for that honor. You know what I mean? So we, we live in a world which is politically charged. and the, you know, We're here, we're in America. We, we have to have a covet for the president. We have to have a car to type for the country. There has to be an amuna. This is where I am right now. The Rabbi Nishan what do you want me to do at this given moment? When you're doing that, you're baking matzah. And if you bake matzah the right way, then you're zaychot to chatzais. And after chatzais, you sit back and say, I did mine, now to Hashem, I resign myself, I am in your hands. And that is the key to all of the brachas in the world. Amen. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.